So for today's event, which focuses on food and faith, we are going to be focusing on three different faiths throughout the day. So we're going to start off by discussing about uh, the Jewish faith and then looking at Roman Catholic and then uh, looking at Sikhism. And to kind of start things off, though, I'd like to introduce Sonia Wu Winter, who is the programs coordinator for the multi-faith resource team. And she has been an integral part of being able to put on this event. So I'd like to welcome you, welcome you in. Thank you, everyone. And it's a real pleasure um, to be able to uh, give you a small taste, quite literally, of the richness of our multi-faith landscape on campus. I thought I'd just share a little bit about our areas of focus uh, and commitment, um, and a bit about that wider landscape that, uh, that is present at U of G. Um, so when I think about our uh, three of our commitments, we have many, but three of the main ones. Um, the first is really to highlight the importance of spiritual well-being as an essential part of holistic well-being. And so to recognize that meaning-making um, discussions of value and purpose and belonging have a place within our university context. And we have resources to support um, that growth and that learning here at U of G. Uh, and to understand that in expansive ways. That certainly can be exploring questions around particular faith traditions, um, but also spirituality in its broadest sense. Our second area of focus is to recognize, celebrate, and support the religious, spiritual, and worldview diversity on our campus. Um, and some of that is highlighted through the work of our multi-faith resource team. Some members are here today. That's our community of religious professionals and community liaisons providing spiritual care to students um, and working together uh, to think about multi-faith programming on campus. Uh, it's also encompassed by our, so in total we have about 17 religious, spiritual, and worldview groups on campus through the MFRT and through the CSA groups that are recognized on campus, and they really help to create that religious, kind of the richness of our religious diversity on campus. And then finally, uh, we have a commitment to um, building and deepening our, our religious literacy as global citizens in the world, whether we are uh, identified with a religious or spiritual background or not. Um, understanding uh, religious contexts for our world is part of what it means to be a global citizen. And finding ways to come together in multi-faith dialogue um, is part of what it means to, to operate in the world today. Um, I think back to when I first started in this role, I had a chance to meet with three of the founders of the multi-faith resource team, um, Ed Damhan, uh, Michael Grand, and Ifti Sheik uh, from three different communities. And what was evident to me when I, I spoke with them was the deep, respectful relationship that they had developed over 30 years ago in coming together to form uh, really anchor multi-faith work on campus. And I think we draw on that sense that people uh, of different backgrounds can build a deep relationship with one another to deepen understanding, um, to share their lives, and I continue to be inspired by that early example. And part of what we know is that um, the ways we deepen understanding, uh, one of the best ways to do that is to sit down at a table together and share a meal, uh, not only within individual communities, but across communities. Um, I'm pleased we're able to highlight food and faith today. That actually happens to be our theme for Multi-Faith Week uh, this coming February, February um, 5th to the 9th. Um, and it'll culminate in a multi-faith dinner where students from uh, all those different backgrounds and uh, across campus will come together uh, to share a meal and, and learn about one another. Uh, so thanks for having us today, and um, I'm looking forward to this too. Well, thank you, Sonia. Sonia. <laughs> Really, um, Sonia has been so helpful for us putting on this event. We reached out to her a few months ago, just wondering what is the multi-faith resource team do on campus? Who are the different people that work? And she's been such a wonderful connector and um, really, really great at being able to kind of teach us a little bit more about what's happening on campus. So uh, yeah, huge thank you to you. So now we are gonna begin and I would like to introduce our next speaker and demonstrator who is Rabbi Raphael Steiner. Rabbi Raphael Steiner is the rabbi and spiritual leader of Chabad of Guelph. Chabad of Guelph is a Jewish organization that serves both the students and the university and the local Guelph community. They host weekly Shabbat dinners, holiday events, learning opportunities, and many 
other social gatherings. So I would like to welcome you to come on up. Hello, everybody. Man, it feels like I'm standing in front of a group of food critics over here. <laughs> It's like, don't shoot, don't shoot, we got this. Smile, loosen up everybody. We're here to make uh, some food and have some fun together. So you've already heard, my name is Rabbi Rafi Steiner. Together with my wife, Musi, we run Chabad of Guelph. And it's a real pleasure and honor to be here to do this with you. So um, the upcoming Jewish holiday is Hanukkah. You probably have heard of it before. We're gonna talk about its meaning a little later. First, um, I'm gonna share with you a holiday food called latkes. And it's a staple within uh, Judaism and specifically the holiday of Hanukkah. So I'm going to talk and work at once. I'm a horrific <laughs> multitasker, but uh, bear with me. We'll, we'll go through that we'll together. We'll go through this together, <laughs> exactly. So latkes is made up of uh, grated potatoes. Should I share the recipe with you? Are you interested to... Okay, I see some people are writing notes yeah. over there. All right. That's it. <laughs> Pull out your pens. We're going to use three potatoes peeled and shredded. We're about to do that here. Uh, we're going to put in a half a onion that's been grated already. Mm -hmm. Thankfully to technology and foresight, I got all of the uh, ingredients ready ahead of time. We have an egg. We have one tablespoon of matzah meal. If you don't know what that is, um, I'll give you my email address and we can have a long conversation <laughs> what matzah meal is. A teaspoon of salt, an eighth of a, of a teaspoon of pepper, and of course, oil for frying. Here we go. All right. Well, your uh, Apple computer could be casualties of the uh, war. Quite all right. There we go. <laughs> okay, we've got, like I said, we've got a uh, three potatoes that have been grated and peeled. Don't forget the peeling. Um, you know what? I need you to, if you don't oh, mind, yeah, let's to get the throw oil going. the oil going. So the, you know, I'm going to give you a little background of Judaism. Um, before we jump into again Hanukkah and maybe what kosher is all about, so there was once a non-Jew, and the story is recorded in the Talmud, that approached a rabbi by the name of Shammai, and uh, he said, "Shammai, Rabbi Shammai, would you be able to teach me Judaism on one foot, which is shorthand for this?" And uh, Rabbi Shammai was like. Um, there's no chance that's ever going to happen, and basically threw the man out of his house. And the story is continued in the Talmud that the, this individual went to another rabbi's home by the name of Hillel. And uh, he went to Hillel and he said, Hillel, can you teach me all about Judaism on one foot? And uh, Hillel said, yes, I can. Don't do to someone else what you wouldn't want done to you. The rest is commentary. And that idea has kind of been adopted in many uh, different religions, but that concept comes from Hillel's words uh, many centuries ago. And so on one foot over here, I'm going to tell you that Judaism is based on one simple tenet, and that is don't do to somebody else what you wouldn't want done to you. The rest is commentary. We believe in Judaism. You know, I'm going to talk and move. Uh, we believe in Judaism that every single one of us was put on planet Earth. By the way, the next step is mix, if you... <laughs> um, that every single man, woman, and child was put on planet Earth for a reason and for a purpose. In fact, my teacher, uh, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, a blessed memory and mentor, uh, would often say that a, the moment a child is born is the moment that God decided the world can no longer exist without you. So every single person here in this room, watching the thousands of people watching online and beyond, I like to think of myself as that popular, um, <laughs> know that the moment, the second that you were born is the moment that God decided planet Earth, the universe, the cosmos, all of it could not exist for another moment without you being here. And if we have a purpose to be on planet Earth, then we have a responsibility to fulfill that purpose. We believe we're working towards a, uh, a better future, a time of Mashiach, which in English is Messiah, that will um, usher in an era where there will be no more war, a very apropos uh, topic for today's day and age. Uh, everyone will be able to live peacefully together. There will be an era where, and I'll say it in Hebrew, 
Kamayim la yom mechasim. Mola haaretz deas Hashem kamayim la mechasim. I'll translate that for you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Which means that the knowledge and wisdom of Hashem, of God, will cover the entire world just like water covers earth. And so that's what we're working towards and fulfilling our purpose and mission to better this world. And every single one of us has an opportunity to do that. And hopefully we usher in the era of Mashiach. That's Judaism on one foot. All right. How are we doing with this uh, It's good. It's oil. feeling pretty hot now. Feeling hot? All right. We're going to mix this up a yeah. little bit more. So all of your ingredients are there in that bowl. All my ingredients are here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about kosher. Okay. How does that sound? I think that sounds great. Okay. We think this is mixed enough? It looks I think pretty, my wife who's mixed. watching thinks this is mixed <laughs> enough. She's, gonna, she's for sure like texting me right now and be like, enough, Rabbi, enough. <laughs> um, kosher is a, uh, a fundamental part of Judaism. We're told in the uh, Torah. Oh, we're burning we're, it already. I think we're getting a little hot. All right, yeah. maybe I'll... Uh, Let's throw something in there. All right, so for latkes, I feel like I'm doing things a little out of order. You know what? Let's, let's back that cool off it. a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go to kosher again. <laughs> um, kosher means fitting. We're taught in the Bible, in the um, Torah, that uh, Jews are commanded to keep kosher. And there's various different parts of kosher. One easy thing to remember is we're prohibited from eating pig, pork, lamb chops, all of that out the window for Jews. That would make a kitchen no longer kosher. Mixing milk and meat, not kosher. Another thing that we're taught in uh, Judaism. And finally, anything that come, any ingredients where a rabbi not blesses them, that's not what kosher is at all. If I can dispel one mm. myth here today, it's kosher has nothing to do with rabbis blessing food. I'd be a lot wealthier if they required rabbis to bless food. <laughs> um, any kind of, um, any ingredients that come from either of those materials um, or just simply not produced in a factory that has only kosher um, supervision would be deemed unkosher. So for example, it's possible that this kitchen could be kosher theoretically. I know it's not. But because I wasn't here when this kitchen, there wasn't supervision, someone that keeps kosher, that knows the laws of kosher, then this kitchen is already considered not kosher. So as hungry as I am, I'm not going to be eating anything here today. I know that you all look very sad, and, uh, but you can enjoy those latkes and look at the rabbi. Um, <laughs> and we appreciate you coming here and making it here. for us. Exactly. It's really nice. Um, so... I'll share one more thing on kosher really quickly, and that is there's different elements of kosher have different um, rules around it. So I'm allowed to cook in a non-kosher food, in a non-kosher kitchen, excuse me. But what I would be prohibited from doing is actually cooking milk and meat together. So cooking any non-kosher item, that's fine. Can eat it, but cooking it is fine. When it comes to making a cheeseburger for you guys, I'd be out, you'd have to find someone else to do that for mm -hmm. you. Or um, anything like that I, I can't benefit from, I can't eat, and I can't cook milk and meat together. That is my crash course in uh, I'm kosher. Im I'm impressed you got that all in. <laughs> got that all in. All right, let's, let's make some latkes already. All right. We've got all our ingredients here. Here, I'll let you We're going to take a um, small little heaping spoonful, okay. and we're going to throw it in there. And we're that's the noise we want to hear, it. That's too. the noise. The sizzle sells the latka. <laughs> we're going to flatten it a little bit. It's traditionally round and flat and small, just like I have it. You know what? I'll make more than one. I can see some hungry people in the crowd. And um, so a little bit about Hanukkah and why latka, what latkas have to do with Hanukkah. So in the year, I actually looked this up before, and of course I'm already forgetting. I think it's 165. <laughs> uh, CE, but I'm terrible with dates, so don't quote me on that. I know we're being recorded over here. <laughs> um, the Assyrian Greeks controlled Jerusalem and the temple, and um, they outlawed Torah study. They outlawed much of Jewish observance, which obviously the Jewish people weren't so keen on. And um, so Jews were forced to go into hiding to practice their Judaism. What they would do is they would hide in caves and study Torah, study the Bible. They would, um, whenever they were guards of the Assyrian Greek Empire coming to check up on them, they would quickly hide their Torah scrolls and pull out 
tops. And this is like a little top, a game that uh, they would play um, in order to hide the fact that they were actually studying Torah. Oops, let's do this. So um, here's my multitasking. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Nice there flip. There we go. Beautiful. We flip it over right when it's uh, nice and golden brown. So they would um, pull out those tops to hide that they were studying Torah, which was, again, prohibited in Jerusalem and Israel at the time. Um, eventually, the Assyrian Greeks weren't pleased with just that level of, um, of prohibition, and so they went into the temple and they desecrated the temple by bringing a pig, a non-kosher animal, on the altar, which would completely violate the uh, temple and the altar from being used as part of the Jewish practice. Um, they went and took all of the oil that was used on the central candelabra, the menorah, inside of the um, temple, and they opened up all of the flasks of oil, which would render it no longer pure to be used for the uh, lighting of the menorah. Every single day in the, in the temple, they would light this seven-branched candelabra called the menorah, and it would have to be, the oil would be, have to be prepared in a certain way, and um, sealed by the high priest so, until it was actually used in the temple. And so when the Assyrian Greeks went in and they completely violated the temple, when the Jews, the Maccabees, um, rose up and eventually took back the Jewish temple again in Jerusalem and wanted to rededicate the temple for Jewish practice and Jewish service, they realized they could not find any oil in order to be able to rekindle the menorah. And part of the daily service was lighting this menorah. And, and it would take eight days in order to properly source more kosher olive oil, pure olive oil, to use in the menorah. Finally, one of the miracles of Hanukkah was they were able to find one untouched, um, sealed flask of olive oil, and they decided that they were still going to light the menorah, even though they only had one day's worth of oil. They lit the menorah, and miracle, lo and behold, the oil with only enough for one day lasts for eight. And it's for that reason, I'm watching my, uh, my latkes <laughs> over here, it's for that reason that we celebrate the eight-day holiday of Hanukkah. And each night, we light another candle, reminding ourselves of the, of the uh, miracle that occurred all those years ago. And that's the holiday of Hanukkah. Why latkes, you ask? Well, perfect timing. I can explain as I pull them out. There we go. Look at that. Are we getting the camera on this? Oh, yeah, we will be. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I want my grandkids to be able to see these, uh, my great-grandkids and future generations to be able to see these uh, latkes for all of time. Um, so, yeah, so, you were explaining why. Yes, why all of the oil, oil plays a central theme in the holiday. And so on Hanukkah, we eat lots of oily and greasy foods. <laughs> so uh, it's not necessarily the best holiday for uh, anyone on a diet. But um, anything that can be fried, deep fried, just dunked in oil, we're eating it. And so if it's a sufganya, which is a jelly-filled donut, we're eating it. Latkas, again, fried in oil, we're eating it. Um, we have a running joke in uh, the Jewish community, and I'll, I think we'll more or less end with this. Mm -hmm. And that is um, the Assyrian Greeks were very into their looks. And uh, remember, they were, again, were oppressing the Jews. And so we talk about that on the holiday of Hanukkah, we eat lots of oily and greasy and fatty foods so that we look nothing like the Assyrian Greeks wanted us to look like. <laughs> and that's the holiday of Hanukkah and latkes. I think we have some latkes to um, yeah, we're share, share with, with all everyone. of you. So you can go uh, home with a little bit of uh, greasy and yummy kosher, or not kosher, uh, <laughs> latka fun in your bellies. That is great. Thank you very much. Oh. And I was just going to ask you one more final thing. Thank you for, for demonstrating and showing us how you make your latkes. My pleasure. How can people learn more or get more involved with the Hava of Guelph or yep, great. what's next steps, I guess, if people okay. want to learn more? Good. Great question. Uh, JewishGuelph.com is in general our website. You can do JewishGuelph.com forward slash any spelling you can possibly think of of Hanukkah. I've set up a short URL so it would end up on our Hanukkah <laughs> page. Um, you can find my email address on that website as well. Again, it's JewishGuelph.com. I have an office in Wraithby House right near the Canon for anyone who's familiar with that side of campus. And uh, I'd be happy to 
meet with you, talk to you about Judaism. We have uh, a really a thriving Jewish community on campus. And if anyone's interested to learn more, then ring my bell. Fantastic. Thank you so much Thank for joining us. Thank you very us. much for having me. <laughs> Okay. okay, so we are now going to start with our, our next demonstration and discussion and learning about another faith, the Roman Catholic faith. And uh, with me to be able to do that, we have Father Patrick Ohl and also Anya. And so Father Patrick Ohl is the um, priest of the Diocese of Hamilton, ordained in 2021. He is currently serving as pastor of Sacred Heart Parish in Rockwood and chaplain at the Newman Center Guelph. And Anya also works with Father Patrick Ohl as the campus minister. So thank you for joining us today. And um, how should we kick things off? Do you want to get cooking right away or do you want to talk a little bit about... Well, when, uh, when we were asked to, to participate in this event, um, we, we were a little stumped at first because uh, uh, the Catholic Church, I don't know if you've heard of us, we're, we're a fairly large organization. Uh, we, we span quite a, a large chunk of the world. There's not really, uh, as a result, a unified Catholic culture. Uh, the stuff that we do here uh, is completely different from the way they practice their faith in parts of Africa, in parts of East Asia, in Central Europe. They're completely different worlds. But Anya and I both happen to be Polish, and so we thought, well, why not talk about something that, uh, that we know well, the, the Polish Christmas Eve dinner? Uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a tradition that uh, uh, basically means uh, you, you have a very large meal on Christmas Eve. Uh, traditionally, you kind of uh, get one of the kids to, uh, to uh, wait and see if they can spot the first star in the night sky. And now that I'm thinking about it, I am convinced that was just a way to get us out of the kitchen. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, one of the kids finds the first star and then we can start eating. Uh, and it's a very large meal. There's 12 dishes, traditionally, uh, for each of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And 12 days of Christmas. That too. Uh, <laughs> and uh, 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 one of the other things is they're all meatless dishes. One of the, the things about Poland, we can talk a lot about Poland, the country. Uh, I, I won't say too much. But uh, it's not the most prosperous nation. It's, uh, and it hasn't been historically. So a lot of the ingredients that we have to work with are things that you can find in the forest, things that are cheap, easily available. So today's uh, dish, croquette, uh, it's uh, with stuff that you'll find, mushrooms, onions, uh, that kind of stuff. So it's a, a fairly accessible meal. Uh, one of the other uh, traditions I should mention is that uh, there's oftentimes an empty seat at our table. That's for if a stranger should happen by, someone who does not have enough food to eat, we can welcome them at our table. And so uh, for, uh, for croquette, we uh, start off with crepes. I'll get the oil going. Uh, they're crepes. I'm not going to explain how to do it. Everybody kind of uh, <laughs> has, a, has crepes or crepe-like dishes uh, to work with. Um, I don't know how to make crepes. Mine always come out as like uh, pancakes. So uh, these have been made by a professional. Uh, we have uh, our filling, which is uh, basically uh, mushrooms, sauerkraut, uh, onions. It's all been cooked, fried up. Uh, you can't uh, just go to the store and get sauerkraut from the jar and just stuff it in there uh, because it would be too wet. It would compromise the structural integrity of what we're about to make here. Uh, so it has to be like your own homemade sauerkraut? No, then, you, can, uh, you can just wring it out. You wring it out, okay. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, when I was a kid, that was my job. You had to do that by hand and, uh, yeah. Take and hours. You probably <laughs> want to cook it through a bit too, right? Yeah. Because sauerkraut can be kind of tough, so you want to cook it down. Yeah, and so uh, the the filling uh, in term there's a few ways that you can fold the the croquette. Um, uh, the the way that I go with is uh, the the easy way uh, is just like that. You you fold the ends there and then you just roll it all up. Looks a little bit like an egg roll, uh, but uh, there you have it. Do you want another? Sure. Is this your favorite? This, uh, this happens to be my favorite of the uh, Christmas <laughs> Eve dishes. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, delicious. Um, uh, 
And uh, there's there's so many uh, different dishes that you'll encounter mm-hmm. at that meal. So you said that there's 12 normally? Yeah. yeah. A and lot what? of soups. You can get a lot of mileage out of the soups. There's uh, mushroom soup. Again, mushrooms, uh, they grow in the forests. They're pretty easily uh, found. Uh, there's pickle soup. There's uh, <laughs> a, a beach soup. Yep. Uh, the, the barsh that uh, uh, we... we uh, that's my favorite. It comes out at all the holidays, the barst does. Uh, and at, uh, at Christmas Eve dinner, there's uh, uh, another thing that you put into the barst. We call them ushka, which... Uh, ears. It, they look like little ears. Uh, they are not ears. They're <laughs> uh, very similar to this, actually. They're like little dumplings that are stuffed with a mushroom sauerkraut kind of mix. Hmm. Clearly, Anya has never made this. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your favorite dish oh then, Oh my Anya? goodness, all, the fish. We have all different types of fish, but any type of fish is my favorite for Christmas Eve. And then chocolate. That's not really one of the 12 dishes. That's what We often get those um, little chocolate bulbs that you hang on the tree. So half of our tree is like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not a good idea. I'll let you in on a little secret. I don't know how to make these either. Uh, <laughs> uh, we got uh, we got the ones that you're going to eat professionally made. So, <laughs> are you willing to say who the professional was? Oh, it's my mother. <laughs> <laughs> she does have a catering business. So, uh, yeah. Uh, once you've got them all rolled up and stuffed up, much like uh, you would with uh, uh, a pork chop or something like that, you put it into an egg wash and then uh, some some breading to, to, to bread it up. Uh, and then you put them into the pan and you fry them. All right, so you're like rolling it to make sure it's all fully covered. He's getting faster, isn't he? I know. Look I'm at impressed. That. Look at him go. <laughs> wow. Well. So, with your work with the the Newman Center and also the Multi Faith Resource Team, what are some of the initiatives that, that you are actually? On it's you? funny because today, every Thursday, we have a um, a free meal for students, and uh, today we're having pulled pork. And uh, one of our students, it's her birthday, and so she requested that. Everyone wear uh, flannel, and <laughs> we're going to do country line dancing after our meal, and um, have a gingerbread cake. It's going to be a fabulous time. So it's excellent. Um, mm-hmm. Food is always at the center of is every religious festival. Feast yeah, it brings people together, I oh, guess. And yeah, you've got to eat. <laughs> I, I do it two, three times a day. It's <laughs> one of those things that I'm become an expert at. <laughs> well, I'm glad we have you here then on, on the event. <laughs> and if my cardiologist is watching, it's always healthy food. Yes. <laughs> so it's funny, we have another another dish with the oil and the frying. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think I put enough in there for you? Yeah, maybe a little, maybe bit, do more. A little bit more. And so what temperature? Usually it's a medium high? Yeah, uh, medium high heat. Once the oil uh, uh, gets hot enough, you just uh, put it into the frying pan. You don't want to overcrowd the frying pan. Uh, if you have to do it in batches, do it in batches. But uh, uh, you, you wait until they're golden brown, you flip them, you do the other side. Once that's golden brown, it's done. So it might take a couple of moments for, for that yeah. to, to get to temperature. Um, one of the beautiful things about uh, our experience of faith is that it is mediated through our culture. Uh, as, as Catholics, one of the central tenets of our faith is that God became human. Uh, and in so doing, he spoke human words, he ate human meals uh, that were conditioned by the culture of his day. It's a, a very, uh, what we call big long word, incarnational faith, where, uh, uh, where just the, the ordinary stuff of daily life becomes a way that God reveals himself to us. And so right now we're preparing a, a food that has religious significance for people of Polish descent. If you go to uh, South Korea, if you go to uh, Africa, if you go to Latin America, they will have different dishes that have religious significance. And the beautiful thing about the Catholic Church is the word Catholic means universal. There is room for all of those traditions, all of those different uh, cultures and uh, uh, customs in our tent. And so uh, that's one of the beautiful things about our faith is that uh, we don't uh, we don't push uh, things out. We try to invite as many people in as we can. All right.
it. It's great. So I think it's looking looks hot. Looks like, yeah. So it's just uh, going to take a couple of minutes per side. Uh, let's do three of them. Yeah. That'll be enough. So you go a couple of minutes per side. So really you're, you're frying it so you want it kind of golden, I guess. Yeah. And Makes it a nice and it uh, crispy exterior and the interior gets nice and warm too. And um, yeah, you can uh, put it in the oven to keep it warm, especially if you're making enough for the entire family and extended family. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the Christmas Eve uh, at our house growing up, it was like 40 people uh, in the same house. So uh, it's uh, it can be a, a big production. Uh, and <laughs> that's, that's why you've got that pro tip of get the kids to look for the star. Keep them out of the kitchen, <laughs> keep them away from the hot oil. Uh, and uh, you can get a lot of mileage too out of pierogi for the uh, to get to that 12 uh, meals. You can have your regular cottage cheese and potato pierogi. You can do cheddar cheese and potato pierogi. You can do them with blueberries, strawberries, sauerkraut and mushrooms. Uh, is that five or six already? So you can kind of cheat your way to, to 12 uh, on a technicality, but uh, they're all good stuff. That's great. Uh, all right, let's... There we go. So what does, uh, I guess you talked about some of the dishes on Christmas Eve. Is there any other kind of special celebrations that happen with, with Christmas Eve and around? Yeah. Food and gathering people or timing or... I mean, our, our faith literally um, uh, is centered on a meal. Uh, uh, Catholics uh, have an obligation to, to go to Mass on Sundays, and Mass is basically uh, a, a meal. We, we all get to, together, we read the Word of God together, uh, the priest or, or deacon or whoever happens to, to be preaching will, will preach the, the, uh, the Word of God. Uh, and then we have some bread, we have some wine, and we believe that that becomes the body and blood of Christ. Uh, but it is basically a meal. Uh, and so our food is very, uh, very foundational to our faith, to our experience of faith. All right. So I'm not going to put them over because I did miss the timing a little bit on that one. It, a, it was actually my fault. It was, uh, I turned the heat up on you, so It was uh, golden brown at one point, but no longer. Uh, so like I said, we did get professionals to, to do the, the rest of them for you, the yeah. ones that you'll be eating. And so that's, uh, that's basically uh, croquette. Uh, they are a little bit more of a, an involved dish, so I didn't show quite all the steps, mm -hmm. but uh, I hope you'll agree that the result is well worth it. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you thank for showing you. us how you make that. And where can people then get more involved and, and learn more or meet with you? Or? <laughs> so the Newman Center at Guelph is located on the corner of Dean and Gordon. Okay. And um, we have a student club we work with, the University Catholic Community. And we have lots of events throughout the year and throughout the week. Everyone's welcome. That's great. And where could people learn about that? Do you have a uh, website? We do have a website, newmancentergwelf.ca. That's great. Thank you. Any, any final last words, Father Patrick? Well, uh, uh, just uh, we're also right next door to another Jewish organization, Hillel House, uh, which has the house next door to us. Uh, and so it's uh, one of the, the many ways that we can kind of uh, uh, showcase cooperation as a multi-faith team uh, uh, instead of staying in our own little boxes and only coming together when we're forced mm -hmm. to, uh, to kind of work together, uh, reach out across the aisle, get to know one another, uh, and just in the spirit of cooperation and peace, which is the goal of all of our faiths, to, to kind of do the work that gets us there. It's a great way to end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we are going to start up now with our next uh, faith that we're featuring and demonstration. So with me now, I have Charandeep Dillon, Singh Dillon, who is a third year sport and event management student here in the Lang School of Business and also the president of the Sixth Student Association. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Maybe let's start off right away. Can you just tell us a little bit about Sikhism? Okay, sure. So hey everyone, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me here and thank you everybody who is joining online and everybody is here. It really means a lot for everybody I know here, you being present and encouraging something like this. So talking about Sikhism, 
Sikhism might be completely new to you or it can be something you know some a uh, bit about but in general i found out even though people know something about it it's not complete knowledge <laughs> or still there are questions which are not asked about so general brief about sikhism is sikhism is a new religion uh, technically we started just 500 years ago uh, in the northern part of india and i said technically because even though that's when the concept of sikhism started it was made a religion just 312 years ago i would say okay. now so uh, we sikhs mainly come from the northern part of india which uh, from a state called punjab punjab literally means a land of five rivers and it has a lot sikhism has a lot of its history around that relig- uh, region so the basic concept about sikhism is that we believe in one god we believe that you can call god by any name you can call him by jesus you can call him ram you can call him allah but at the end it's the same being is the same universal power that runs everything that created everything that has no enemies that is immortal that has no gender and is the reason for everything to exist So before I continue more I'll quickly start with the cooking because yes. the thing I'm going to make today is called kara prasad. So you might have had it before if you have been to a gurudwara. So kara prasad is the thing where when you visit a gurudwara it's an offering given to everybody who visits a gurudwara. It's a very simple dish made out of just four and in- uh, five ingredients. first of all which is ghee which is also known as clarified butter mm-hmm. secondly uh, whole wheat flour third it's sugar fourth it's water and fifth is bani bani is basically the prayers you sing around or the blessings you have into ah. the food so the concept of kara prasad is that not everybody can visit the gurdwara and have langar which i'm going to talk more about okay. but still to get the blessings of god they can have a little bit of something and still feel got the blessings of god okay so I'll quickly start with cooking okay here i can help you yep. put this on so, so what temperature do you want it at a oh, medium like, heat um little towards the higher side okay high, high side high. okay and then you're going to add it right yep. into the bowl okay we're going to go up here yeah. all right so the first thing i'm going to add is basically the ghee into the pot uh, pot and uh, Okay, got spoon the there. The quantity for making kara prasad is one of the easiest things you can do because you do not need to worry about the quantity. Whatever depending on how much ever you want, the ratio of everything is pretty simple. So you take one portion of ghee, the same amount you take is uh the flour and the equal amount is sugar. So it's one is okay. to one is to one. So right now I'm using one cup for example, so everything is one cup. and the fourth ingredient is uh water which is usually around 2.5 to 3 uh times of everything the reason water is more than all the other three yeah. ingredients is basically you can say water in this uh dish is like the concept of calmness and being humble so to connect to god to reach the almighty what we believe is you need to be you can have everything in this world but you need to be most humble and be calm and honest to connect, uh, connect to god so that's why we add more water to this dish okay so basically once the ghee becomes a bit warm yeah, what's like a liquid now yeah it becomes a liquid and ghee technically usually a liquid but because of the weather it freezes into and it solidifies So once it's a bit warm we're going to add the flour and then basically what we do is keep on mixing so that uh a thing with like indian style cooking is it's usually slow and it uh, involves lots of heat so we try to create flavor from the heat and create like mix things properly mm-hmm. so that there is a taste developed in yeah. them so you mentioned to me normally it's over the fire is yeah. that correct yeah so this uh, dish usually is made over the fire this is in fact the first time i'm making it on an induction <laughs> so i hope it's going to be the same yeah and one thing as i mentioned the fifth thing which was bani is usually when we make kada prasad is we either uh, saying bani which is prayers 
the prayers which are written by our gurus to connect to the god while we make it we add that to it so i could be either playing it in the background or mm-hmm. while making it i would be singing the prayer so that the richness of the prayer goes actually into the prasad and everybody who eats it that's great and you also mentioned to me that the looks like it's starting to get hot yeah. that the pot also matters yeah so kara basically means uh I don't know if it's a uh, kada basically means it's made in a kadhai which is basically a pot which is more curved so that you can it mixes everywhere mm. equally so that is why it is usually made on fire it is difficult to make it balance on an induction mm. but this was the closest thing I can get to <laughs> so that I can still have the feeling of mixing it properly and get the same result okay So I think once the ghee is hot, we yeah. we can add the flour. You do not add the whole flour directly. You try and uh, push oh, it around so time. that it doesn't uh, form lumps. And so it was equal parts, I guess. So yeah. it's almost like making a a roux or something. <laughs> so it's going to be pretty interesting to watch every time I watch this being made. is it's like oh it's liquid now but when i add water it's going to solidify i don't know how does that happen but i think <laughs> it, it just amazes me every time <laughs> right and do you want to talk about people who are online and probably everyone who's at their table don't know that you're not wearing shoes right now okay yeah do you want to talk about the importance of that so basically since a kada prasad is an offering to god and we believe uh, in the uh, indian cultures that we do not wear shoes inside a, pl- a place of prayer that is why we make kada prasad or any of the food which is made in gurdwara is made barefoot so that uh, the germs from outside are basically not near the food you make so it's really bubbling right now yeah. so do you how long do you end up So basically like it's there is no time for it depending on the quantity it can be different basically you look for try to make it a bit reddish right okay uh like a biscuit color so that you know like the flour is properly cooked and so the kada prasad was basically uh, started by the first sikh guru guru nanak whose birth anniversary we just celebrated i think Uh, 3 days ago now mm-hmm. so guru nanak was the founder of sikhism he was the first sikh but one thing which you would notice is all the sikh people nowadays have the last name as singh so like my name is charandeep singh but guru nanak did not have that uh, because he was the first sikh and the singh thing when actually started when a 10th guru he actually made sikhism into a proper religion into a proper faith to protect others so the concept of sikhism was formed because during those times there was lots of oppression going on in india there were lots of things such as uh widows being burnt alive once their husband has died so there was lots of forceful conversion and other things such as um uh, like forcing people to do things against their will the rulers were in the best that time and that is why sikhism kind of started as a rebel religion to break all the concepts of like things which a uh, guru spread were wrong and to actually uh, stand up to them so one thing when in india which was super common was the caste system and guru nanak said there won't be any caste from now on that is why we all have the same last name because caste in india were mainly uh, related to your last name so if you have a particular last name people could easily identify mm. your caste but we believed in equality and that is why we were like everybody should have the same last name similar concept was for the turbans so you see sikh people wear turban the reason for that is that uh, turbans in india were considered to be worn by leaders and a guru said that everybody of you is a re- leader mm. in themselves and that is why everybody is going to wear a turban and everybody who wears a turban usually has long hair so there are five a uh, case with a sick actually needs to wear i am not a proper sick i haven't been baptized i would say we call it amrit shakna and uh, once you become a baptized sick you need to wear five case 
First of them is case, which is basically your hair. So you need to have uncut hair. Second thing is kirpan. So you might have seen some Sikhs have a little sword with them. We call it kirpan. Kirpan is basically the concept of that is that a guru said you should be always be ready to uh, help others and to help others, especially in those times it was lots of uh, lootings. So that you are always ready, you uh, need to have a sword, you need to learn how to fight so that whenever somebody is need in need, you can uh, help them, you are always ready. Third thing is a kada, which I am wearing right now. It is a metal bangle you wear in your hand. And uh, fourth thing is a kashera, which is like shorts, I would say, which was worn by both men and women. And the fifth thing... Which I have my Oh, is a kanga. So to, because we have uh, long uncut hairs, to keep a hair uh, straight and like clean, we keep a kanga which is like a comb and all the six have that within their turban. Hmm. So that's the K which people usually don't know about because the others are kind of visible, but that's like people usually keep it inside their turban. So that's something what they don't know about. Thank you for sharing that. And so right now it's bubbling a lot. Yeah. Do you think it's it's ready for the next step? I would say just a little more because after this it's like a very quick process. Okay. So once it starts to get a bit more red, that's when you and know it's it you know. properly cooked. Okay. And you keep on moving it so that it st doesn't start burning mm -hmm. from the bottom because this will be like a very super quick cooking like it is this now it looks it's slow but then the moment you add water or sugar it will quickly can go super wrong <laughs> and Always with my an experience eye. i need to be totally focused on this <laughs> i've been impressed you've been able to tell us everything while you're keeping an eye and so how is food important in so, sick faith sikhism has basically three pillars or uh, three main concepts which we believe in First of them is Kirt Karo, which is to do an honest earning, to do whatever work you are. We believe that to connect to God, you do not need to become just a saint like you go and just pray always, but you need to do whatever you're doing naturally and be honest while doing it. Do not steal from people and earn an honest earning. Second one is uh, Kirt Karo, Nam Japo, that means to pray. You definitely should pray, I think, yeah. Yeah, I can see it's starting be. to go kind of yeah. red for him. Second thing is to pray. We believe that it is definitely important to pray. You can pray to any God. You can pray it in any way. It's just important to pray. It's important to connect to the Almighty and be a good human. And the third thing, yeah, I think, yeah, this is good. Very good. Okay. Yeah, I definitely did it a bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> so now we can add sugar to it. Okay, so again, that's the equal part sugar. Yeah. So that was equal sugar. And you still want it on the heat? Yeah. But this time we're going to keep the heat towards the lower side. Okay. And the third concept which it makes is uh, makes food super important in a religion is one chakra, which is basically not just earn for us, yourself, but when you earn, distribute it amongst the needy, distribute it amongst everywhere. And that's how the concept of langar started. So basically, when you go to any Sikh Gurudwara, you can have free food, free vegetarian, fresh food, whenever you want. You do not need to be a Sikh. You do can mm -hmm. follow any religion. You just need to go there and you can have free food, how much ever you want. And in fact, even stay there at certain Gurdwaras, like basically a Gurdwara should be a place where you can freely practice, uh, you can be feel safe and have food. So the concept of Langar, which is free food for everyone, was started by Guru Nanak Dev Ji and that was started with 20 rupees, which I would say is equivalent of 20 cents in Canada. And that's how it started and right now it is for us, we consider it to be the best business. So how it started was his dad uh, realized like my son is like, he's 18 or 19 now, he needs to go out and uh, do some business. So he gave him 20 rupees and was like, yeah, go buy some things from the market and then sell them. 
So, or like basically do a business. When Guru Nanak did that, uh, while he was going there, he saw some saints sitting and they were just praying to God and they were like hungry. So he realized, uh, what I can do is he went to the market, he got some uh, uh, ingredients and prepared food for them from that 20 rupees and then uh, gave them food. So basically that's how the concept of Langar started where and right now the same 20 rupees we believe is what is uh, causing the funding for every Langar in any part of the world and any Gurudwara. So giving food away to the needy is a very very big part of a religion. Mm -hmm. In fact giving in general is a very big part. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add water to it. So while I add water, it's super important that I keep it moving because it's going to quickly form into solid. So the... You want it on a higher temperature? Yeah. Like a medium? Yeah. Soon the flour will absorb the water and then it will solidify. And that's when you get the kada prashad. So the ingredients used in this uh, are pretty simple ingredients. You might have noticed flour, water, uh, ghee, and uh, sugar. So the reason uh, we use these ingredients is that uh, these ingredients, even though they look simple, it's pretty hard to get them. Like water, it comes through so many different streams, hitting so many different rocks. And that's when we usually get water. Even sugar, you need to crush a sugar cane, then it has a super heavy, extensive process to uh, become the final product. Same thing with ghee, it's like you keep on uh, clarifying the butter and that's when you get ghee. And similar to that is, uh, what was the last one? A uh, flour. It's like you need to basically grind uh, wheat to get flour. So all these things, even though they are simple ingredients, they need to go through a lot to be the final self. And that is why we use all these ingredients for to make kada prashad. Oh, and we can see it starting to thicken yeah. now as you're going. It's great. Um, I know that we are starting to come up close on our time, but I wanted to ask you, can you maybe talk to us a little bit more about the Sex Student Association that you're the president of? What are some of the things that you do? And yeah. So the Sex Student Association is an association not just for the Sikhs, but to represent the Sikh religion to everyone and try and promote its uh, qualities and its beliefs to everyone and just inform people what Sikhism actually means. So some of the things we do is uh, Turban Up. Turban Up uh, is now an annual event where anybody can come, try and wear on a turban and try to see what does it, how does it feel to be a Sikh. Because people say it's easy to wear a turban but there comes many responsibilities with it. Whenever I say that dialogue I think of Spider-Man <laughs> and I feel like every time I wear a turban I represent my community. And that is why it's those things which come up uh, while wearing a turban. So you can come and try on a turban. We usually do it around the month of March. So you are more than welcome to come and try on a turban. Another thing we are going to do is going to host a langar on campus. And uh, where that's where you can come and have free vegetarian food. Mm. And we're going to try and keep the concept of Guru Nanak uh, our first guru come to the university. Now you can see this has solidified. And the key thing to know if it's properly cooked or not is like when you do uh, move your spatula like this, if there are lumps being formed, that means you can add a bit more water. But right now we know there are no lumps formed. The ghee is, you can kind of see it outside. It's shiny. Mm -hmm. That means that this has been properly cooked. And okay. one thing which makes kada prashad into actual prashad is how after it's made, it is basically offered to God. So we take it to, we do an ardas, which is a prayer where we say like, God, please bless uh, the kada prashad, which we have made. And uh, we are going to distribute it to everyone. So your blessing goes to everyone. So that's the basic concept of kada prashad. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So it's all done yeah. now then. Um, so we do have 
some that you made earlier here as well too, but it looks great. And I can't wait for us to all try that. And as we now come to the end of, of the event, um, I just you told us a little bit about what the, the Sex Student Association is doing. How can people find, find you or learn more? So to find us, we are on Instagram because being a student club, we mainly try and uh, <laughs> do it through social, uh, do an advertisement through social media. So we are on Instagram, SSA at uh, SSA Guelph. So that's where you can find us, know about the different things we are doing, or even just we even provide knowledge to people about what some of the things in Sikhism mean and when uh, we have like a festival, when we have a good put up. One thing I would like to tell you all is the Kara Prashad which you guys are having is actually made in the Gurudwara and uh, it has been blessed so it is the actual thing which you would have got if you went to a Gurudwara. Well thank you, I'm so happy that you are able to share that with us and, and tell us more. I think. There's probably a lot of people who learned a lot today, so thank you. And uh, just in wrapping up, I want to say a huge thank you to all of our guest speakers today. Thank you as well to everyone who came in to tune in and everyone online as well. Uh, this event, as I mentioned at the beginning, Deep Dish Dialogues, is an event put together by the School of Hospitality, Food and Tourism Management, and also the Errol Food Institute. And a huge thanks as well to the multi-faith resource team at the University of Guelph. We look forward to seeing you again. We're going to take a little bit of a holiday break now that we, we know everything about kind of holiday and food. I hope everyone gets to spend some great time with family and uh, eating food, and we'll see you in the new year in January. Thank you.